Good afternoon to everybody. I was delighted to be present, though passively, in this most rich and edifying conference and meet old and new friends. Um, I'm also delighted to chair the la this last session, which, like the nature of other literature will embrace quite unrelated matters, poetry, theosophy, and cultural studies. Uh, the, the first uh, speaker is Galili Shachar from Tel Aviv University, a professor of comparative literature, teaches German, Hebrew, and Persian poetry, currently in service as chair of the School of the Cultural Studies at Tel Aviv University, holds the Marcel Reich Ranitsky Chair of German Literature. Galili will talk about the cup bearer, dialectic of desire, divine, divine wisdom, uh, reading Ibn Gabirol together with Hafiz. Thank you. Many thanks for the introduction and for being here. And for you all for coming, for the attendance, and for, for the colleagues at, at, abroad or at home. Uh, I was delighted you know, to participate at a few sessions in, from the beginning of, of the conference. I apologize for not being in, in presence today. You know, it's academic administration calls us sometimes into duties. Uh, but I'm very happy to be part of, of, of this session uh, towards the end of, of uh, a great conference. And again, uh, um, Ariel and Omer uh, on, on, on his way back. And many thanks for the invitation and for the, uh, you know, for the uh, uh, right to, to be here with you. So as you heard by Tova, um, what I'm to introduce is where I'm sitting. Uh, um, it's a study. Uh, a research, of course, but uh, something that is still in Shlaveli mood, right? Uh, uh, and it's as it's 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 rhythmic and 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 it's detours and and, and learning. Uh, so it still belongs, I think, to the you know to the capacity, to the framework of, of of a seminar rather than sitting and, lec and lecturing. As if I have conclusions, I have I have questions, and sometimes the questions are uh, are themselves they, they need like rephrasing, you know, and isuach a better phrasing. So this is why I, I ask to uh, uh, to sit and and, and to discuss. Um, and so I'm to begin, and, and um, perhaps we can. I mean, uh, I also, you know, it would be easier to follow a few of the poems read um, uh, from from the presentation that I sent later today to to Ila. Uh, it's it's bear the title Sapiname. Okay, thank you, Aria. Thank you, Mike. So, um, let, let, let's begin. Um, the the love points by uh, Solomon Ibn Gabriel refer in, in a few cases to the celebrated figure of, of, the, of, of the wine cup bearer, uh, a mosaic, saki, nosea kos, associated with both profane, erotic, sensual references and divine allusions in Hebrew. This figure of a boy serving in a tavern or in a wine garden or in a courtyard embodies beauty and desire, erotic presence of a double face, both of pleasure and of pain. This figure was not rare to find also in points by uh, Shmuel Nagid, Moshe ibn Ezra and Yuda Levi, to name a few. Those poems related to profane section of love, wine, and garden, while inviting 
praising, yet often reproaching the beloved for its harshness, cruelty. And they were symptomatic as such to a certain discourse of love, dialectic by its nature. Beyond its trope, its conventions of wine poetry, associated with masculine beloved, describing a young deer, in Hebrew, atzvi, in Arabic and Persian, razul, hints at diversities of being, complexities of subjectivity and gender ambiguities that were imprinted in Jewish and Muslim worlds. The lecture, or as I prefer to say, the study, offers to discuss even Gabriel's love poetry in a comparative framework, providing a detour into the world of Hafez, the Persian poet from Shiraz of the 14th century, whose famous love poems, mostly the Ghazals and his Sapiname Masnavi, the book of the cup bearer, present radical forms of desire, eshk, drunkenness, masti, erotic confusion, and gender ambiguities. Those states, Hale, are not untypical to the so-called classical Persian poetry. One has in mind Farid Adin Atar, Jalaluddin Rumi, Molana, and Saadi, referring to both, again, sensual and spiritual experiences, which itself or themselves were associated with certain Sufi schools. The lecture, rather short and selective this evening, of a few cases present mainly a few methodological considerations before providing the examples. For reading even Gabriel with Hafez is a conjunction, not self-evidential one, yet not arbitrary too, I would like to argue. Such a reading demands an inversion, decontextualization. It demands both de and re territorialization by re relocating or reading even Gabriel into a new context, inviting his poetry into different symposium. Mishtem is said right? Different symposium. So not the Hebrew tradition alone, reading, for instance, Ibn Gabirol love poem with Shmuel Anagid. No, the Arabic as a prior reading Ibn Gabirol after Abu Nuas, for example, are to provide us with the same experimental, imaginative dimensions of a comparative reading that is based on the attempts of reorientation, inversions, and detours in literary studies between Hebrew and Persian. Because the poetic encounter of Hebrew and Persian while engaging other tradition, the Greek, Arabic, the Turkish, alongside the Spanish, but also the German, the English, is to provide us with new map of world literature. What we search for is a path, a method, a way, but also in the sense of tariq, a study, theological and creative of its, of, of, of its, of its sense calling the foreign into a conversation, a gathering, again, a different symposium that doesn't deny differences while acknowledging its own task of translation, also its detours and failures. Reading Ibn Gabirol after or with Hafez while justified as an act of conversation, gesprech, sikha, somewhat particular, accidental, or even esoteric, calls us nevertheless to acknowledge the network of Euro-Asian language and literature, following lines of cultural migration and exchange, enterprises of translation, adaptation of literary knowledge and reclaiming of traditions. It is, one may admit, almost an act of private reading, what I'm suggesting this, this evening, as you may say, even a secret one, biographic. Why at all reading Ibn Gabriel for um, However, I may argue that may signify forms of correspondences. We asked us about the common, so we, we suspend actually the, the question about common origin or influences. Very important questions, but they are to be suspended this evening. We were ready to suspend the question regarding traces of cultural exchange as they were taking shape indeed in the world of Islam from Spain, from Andalus to India. So we are aware that there were connections, but we are willing to suspend them in order to create another network of correspondences. As stated already, what we look for, what we search is a method of comparative study that gathered around the figure of the Saki, a mosaic in Hebrew and Persian poetry of late antiquity. You know, I'm, I'm not very fan of, in favor of using the term medieval <laughs> regarding the world of Islam and Judaism, but I will not deny it necessary usage, so we know it's, it's not you know, to deny it to create a, another blind spot, but I'm saying late antiquity being also aware of the problematic, of the problematic uh, uh, term while you know, referring to, to periodization. 
but nevertheless, I, I hate to say that. So the study signifies the dialectic of desire. So, you know, attraction and, and object, pleasure and pain, presence and absence as attached to gender ambiguities regarding not only the sexual or gender identity of the beloved or of the speaker. Is it a girl? Is it a boy? But to the core or causes of subjectivity, the self, its faculties, its reason, body, the soul, its mood, Stimmungen, its anxiety and pain, its acts of language, also its silence. Here I'm to follow, among others, the research of Otto Rosen uh, on the figure of Atzvia, demonstrating the conventions of masculine phallocentric love discourse in Arabic and Hebrew, while searching for traces of often silent female beloved. Nicely she, saw, she sh uh, shows in her work how the love poem itself reveals its method of representation, as if adapting the method of the beloved while revealing and concealing yourself in a play of love. So the, the method related to the female figure become the method of the poem itself, which is fascinating. Yet those poetical conventions, not only because of their generic implications, but whether because of their gender, social and cultural implications are to be addressed critically, not without a feminist deconstruction. My own lecture, this is one of Tova's uh, own achievements. My own lecture by moving to the field of transgender studies, and mainly by following the critic of, of, of masochism, both as a poetical and ethical deconstructive dimension of subjectivity, this is where I'm in my own comfort zone, will offer a theoretical comfort zone, will offer perhaps a different view of beauty, pain and pleasure as represented in those poems. So love poems, if they are truly entitled to be called by this name, because you know, not, any, not every mode, attraction, being together is of love. Right? You need a certain extreme to be addressed there. However, may you refer also to transformative, constructive, yet somewhat ecstatic, destructive dimension in the being of the subject. There is certain madness in love, right? So in state of love, beyond or better say, through its performative acts, the self is brought in danger. Yet this drama of subjectivity is itself complicated in Ibn Gabriel and Hafez with a say, profane sensual erotic discourse that holds theological or religious allusions or references associated with the divine. Which is, you know, it's, it's not a new argument, but I really like to stress it. Because if we are to challenge borderlines, this is the title we chose for this, uh, for this conference. If we are to challenge borderlines, these two belong to the discussion the double values of desire in love poetry, its double implications. So how to start? And you know, how to start is, is it's, it's the question itself, right? How, how to begin such a research, how to start? Because such a study may begin with different paths and different points of departure. One of those is, for example, reading of the Hebrew Song of Song. To begin with, alongside, for example, the land, the, the, the land of Majun and Laila, Right, to, to bring them together and to look for correspondences, signifying the literary act itself as an expression of love sickness, right? Affiliated, however, with ethics of alterity, which may find, which direct us to comparative reading of Hafez and even Gabriel as poets of Mahlat Ava. One way of doing that. Another path, inspired by the post-colonial theory, moves to Hebrew, Arabic, and Persian, not without a critic of its Western receptions. So not playing as if, right? There were not 200 years of reception translations dealing with inventions of philologies and a comparative literature. So the study of Islam and Judaism, as we know, was not free from Orientalist assumptions. Even philology, translations, of course, were not free from that engagement, right? It's, 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 it's part of our self-reflective dimension of our own study. One bears in mind the wonderful case of William James, right? An example of a colonial enterpriser, yet curious and engaged one, right? Who brought, for example, the name of Hafez, Saadi, Ferdusi to Europe. We may think also of the case of Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, the West official divan, his own encounter with Hafez, alongside his translations, Goethe's translations of Southern Song, Quran and Nasi. So Goethe is a point of departure. 
Tis the Orient itself, reflected in Goethe's work as a mode of free spirit. While associated with sensual presence, drunkenness, and wealth of being, his own divan demands us his late, unexpected readers to follow him, but in inverted modes, stepping back from German to Hebrew and Persian against the major stream of European rentalism in a search for different forms of dialogue and translation. And you know, so this late passage that I just read is, is not only to admit my own you know, Germanistic background, so I, I cannot do it without the German, which is a question why, but also to, um, you know, to reflect a way of turning back to Goethe after reading even Gabriel Hafez and other underwear. Although Goethe was, like I, I said, that he was one of the figures that led me, you know, to rethink the, the, the usage of Eastern, Eastern literatures in, in readdressing, uh, for example, the concept of Welt Literatur, right? Goethe's own term for world literature. So this is some of the consideration that was not, that still to be, if at all, decided. You know, Poems of Departure says, says a lot. So here I am. Today, in the context of our symposium, another rather minor, seems to be rather references, can be applied for initiating the conversation of Ibn Gabriel and Hafez. And his famous essay, Atzvi Bashira Ivrit Shel Mabina, Chaim Sherman argues about the figure of the Tzvi as a beloved boy, Nar Hashub, a figure of homoerotic desire, being inspired by Muslim, Arab, 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 Arabic poetry, that itself was anchored in cultural experience and social forms of life. So the now Hashuk Katsidi has its own life, right? So, uh, in, the, in the Arabic and Persian culture. There is no need, we know the argument, I repeat it you know, for, just for, for ourselves. There is no need, Shirman argues, not without certain just, to assume that those Hebrew poems praising, reproaching, lamenting the love of a boy its beauty and harshness were not always a necessary based on personal experience of the Hebrew poets themselves, but rather can be read as an artistic articulation, a literary fashion that nevertheless, one has the right to assert, was associated with certain impact of the major Muslim society and culture. The poetry of the beloved, beautiful boy, thus expresses a strange contradiction, stira muzara, Shiman says, in the world of the Hebrew poets, among them Anagid ibn Gabiron. So he continues and writes, The remark by Sherman, arguing that the influence of the Arabic surrounding on the Hebrew poets was so strong, so they uh, so that they receive the love of the boy, if not as a praxis, right? uh, then as a matter for their poems, although it deserves critique and further discussion, such as delivered by Norman Rolf and also by Tova in their work on the beloved boy of the Hebrew poetry, regarding the ambiguities of desire, Ibn Gabriel is to serve us well, right? This is why I mentioned another point of departure, you know, how to address the, the, the core questions of how to compare, why to read together uh, uh, those traditions. Because not only the tension between the personal biographical experience, was it real? And the literary conventions is being mar marked here. Not alone the contradictions of Allahic norms seem to be crossed in this poetry. Again, this boundary cross. Ariel, I heard the question of your conference. The tensions between the sensual and the allegorical, the negotiations regarding the borderlines of, of the sacred and the profane, Ben Kodesh Lachot, are also to emerge while reading Ibn Gabirol's poetry of love are in play. So I, I will now move to the first example, if I may. Thank you. Right, you know the example for other symposiums and, and, and courses. Um, I read the poem. Tenakos veim ein shtehu. ובדמות לחייך הבר רעהו, וכולי ממך כמעט וימות, בעיניים ככולים אך יהו. אשאול בנו במצוות דר ערבות, ואם בלבבך הצדק, עשהו. The poet, the speaker, who sits in a company, 
calls the sake, seeking so the, the, the cup barrier, asking for a cup of wine, tenakos, waiting for the attendance of the boy, whose face, his cheek, looks in one version, while I'm using the, the, the mostly the Brody, Brody Schumann edition, in one version while judged by its form, like a wine jag, cad, Another version measured by its color, like the wine itself, which is pure, bad. The poet, sick of love and devoted to beauty, asked the servant to serve, to save him by its beauty and to govern, Mesholban, by the name of heaven, Dal Aravot. Now, more will be said about the depth of desire, the economy of pain and pleasure, sensual courses, and anthology of absence, the im ein of this point. More will be say on the reflections, the mirroring, the eye, the gaze that are in play in the poem. More will be said on the allusion of God's name in the call of justice, signing the poem. More we were about to say about the idea of love sickness, the economy of, of masochism, violence and moral alterity being ex expressed in the figure of the cup area. As recalled in another poem by Ibn Gabirol, I read its first verses, if I may, the next example. I'm sorry for... ישורני ואף אפו כחולה, והכוס מדמות לחיו ממולה, וניבב משפתיו דר עלי דר, ובשחוק פיו בהתם לא יסולה, והניבות אשר בם יקטלני כניב נושה עלי איש רש ונקלה. So love is represented in those verses in the dialectic of sick, poor, objected bodies, in one version, Yishureni ve'af api. So not the poet alone, but the Saki too, af apo, seems ill. Yet those figures are sensual, creaturely, painful, and engage in a performative scenery where the eye, the, the mouth, lips and teeth, ve'nivav misfatav, are in a play. It is the play of language itself, however, that reveals itself in this poem the opening of the mouth, drinking, kissing, biting, laughing, singing, what we call mother tongue, the maternal feminine texture of language takes shape and represents itself in those figures of desire. But let us know in the middle of that, we just start a conversation. Turn and read a few verses from Hafez Sakiname, included in his div divan, providing us again with a detour or even an interruption. We just begin. Ein Umweg, as we say in German, a path of a comparative reading. The following verses calling the cup bearer to approach, to bring the wine, read from the middle of this long point. You must move. So another. Right. So I will read only the Persian. There is an English translated version down there. Bia Soki and Bekore Masture Maus. Ke andar kharabad darade nishas. Be man de ke bad nam khoham shudan. Kharab me ujam khoham shudan. So the cup bearer, the saki, brings with him the wine, bearing yet a secret. Sitre shikurin, a secret. Concealment of the drunk, masture mas. So the secret of the drunk, of, of drunkness. The poet who sits in the tavern in the Persian Kharabat, a word that reads also at the sight of the broken hearts, the drunk, calls the cupbearer to share a secret with which, which is hidden in that which is pure. A secret which is hidden in that which is pure. Bekar, which means also virgin, untouched, young body. In the second verse, the poet confesses his desire, infected his own name, bad nam, bad nam, it's a bad name as being broken, drunk of wine, a harabe me. What the poet wishes for drunkness refers, as we know, in, in major Sufi poetic positions to the sp spiritual in intoxication. The ruins of the self, the rapture of subjectivity are a condition of a spiritual freedom that is associated with the transformative state of both body and soul. The poet who calls the sake to bring the wine cup, may you jump, refers to both, ero both erotic sensual experience and spiritual. So once we turn back to read Ibn Gabirol, love poem, Tena Kos, 
We are not allowed to associate our reading to those references and allusions. The Persian word beka corresponds to the Hebrew bar, which implies purity, both in the erotic sexual meaning and its allegorical implications, implying a divine virtue. And more, the Persian poet, not unlike the Hebrew, is aware of his sickness, humiliation, abjection as essential aspect of experiencing love, heshk, masochist forms of desire, association of pain and pleasure, wounding, blood, the feminization of the erotic body being governed by the other, and the rapture of masculine subjectivity are read in the Persian poem as an experience necessary of its kind for elevating oneself towards the divine forms of being. So there is no need now to argue anew on Ibn Gabriel as a mystical poet, or to discuss again in association with early forms of spiritual tradition to, 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 to reach later on the Sufi schools. However, once we return to read this poem with Hafez, our reading is loaded with intensive implications and challenges of dichotomies and of the profane, offering us another perspective on the dialectic of Kodesh Bachot. Affiliated, however, with transformative dimension of gender and subjectivity. The Hebrew poem by Ibn Gabirol refers, we recall, to mirror effects, the face, the eye, the cheek and the beloved, that resembles in form and color the wine cup. The beauty of the boy is a mirror of blessing, a wealth of creation, while referring to sickness and death. It comes together. This image is not odd to find in Hafez poetry. In the Saki Name, the wine cup implies itself a mirror, an image, acts, which carries with it a message beyond of prophecy. His vision of death, the death of the legendary Iranian kings, Jam and Kai Kavus, being reflected in the glass of wine in Hafez's poem. But the reflection of the wine, we are told in other verse, is a vassal of the highest form of knowledge. Thank you, thank you. So again, it's a very selective reading out of the Mas Mavi, Sakhina Me. Mananam kechun jom gir be das, bevinam dar an aine al che has. As ani wa nutelet gvi ayayin le yado, ve re be mar eu et kol sheishu. I'm the one who's taking the cup in the hand, see the mirror, what is there, whatever the man. His view regarding the secrets of divine knowledge embodied in the wine is rather often found in Persian poetry. Wine is the fire of heaven, a gift of angels. The cup bearer served as an agent of higher education. In Hafez, love poems, in many of his razals, the, the, the Sauki, however, is associated not alone with the figure of a young, beautiful boy, also with that of an old man, Kiri, who served as a Sufi guide alongside the figure of the Rendi. So actually, the cup bearer is the sheikh. So, and or Rendi, it's a poor, rotten, abject person who embodies heresy, sexual freedom, and mysteries. So it's not only the boy who is the car, who is you know, untouched, but all the way around. Once we return to read again, Ibn Gabriel, for instance, his love poem, Igzol Shnat Aini, we may listen differently to the verses telling about the Tzvi, the beloved boy, and the visions of the wine cup. The sight of the wine brought by the cup bearer, the tzvi here, its color and face red, we read as the light of heaven that is, once you recall, with your permission, the shibuts of the biblical verse on the book of Daniel, Bamaskilim Yaziru Kezoa Rakia a sign of the secret knowledge, prophetic one. A tzvi, a name of the beloved, applied as in Talmudic Midrash, in allegorical interpretation of Son of Song, for example, a name of a divine being, not only of a beloved boy, also signify a messianic, messianic arrival. Sensual, yet absent, joyful and lamenting, erotic and pure, masculine yet feminized, selfish but devoted to, consumed by love, a boy, its beauty is of divine measure. Reading Ebe Gabriel with Hafez is a path. I'm coming to conclusion. I told him, I have permission, another sentence or two. May I? Thank you. 
So reading in the Gabriel with Hafez, again, is a path, a matter of which certain experience is implied. Let me try to summarize it. First, an attention to differences, diversities of expression, which takes place in and within different poetic traditions, such as Hebrew and Persian, that may serve us as an invitation to a new conception of comparative studies due to the its Eastern context. So it's different mode of, of com comparison that are being implied once we are in the East, first, first argument. Second, awareness of our own in uh, in intervention, our own reflection of our own doings or role as readers who work in with translations, sensing also the untranslatable. So not only as obstacles, how to translate you that extremely big and into English. Yes, now. Not only as obstacles, but or as the board lines that are uh, uh, crossable or uncrossable, but rather as a milestone. So the untranslatable may refer, refer to be as a milestone, a condition of a comparative theory that never denies its, in, its, yeah, it, its own considerations, how to translate or how to compare. Third, revealing poetic figures, structures, and the genre itself, the wine poetry, as form of life, dynamic and transformative that may be understood alongside its aesthetic value in also in terms of ethical measures or as poetical substance of a, com of a community to come, right? So reading uh, Ibn Gabriel Hafez is imaginary way of path, but nevertheless, and possibility of a community to come. Fourth, signifying the courtly love poem as a substance for expression of ambiguous state of subjectivity associated with performative acts and gender roles while deconstructing masculinity and heteronormative orders. Five, understanding the dialectic of the sensual and the spiritual, the profound and divine, as represented in those poems, challenging modernist, secularist perception of literature, in inviting, inviting us to celebrate it differently. And six, marking the contradictions, differences of the belonging of being Jewish, being Muslim, as a local substance of world literature, world literature. So the next step will be to move to Goethe. To the experience of this study and of research, the poems of Ivan Gabirol and Hafez serves us today, this evening, as a mirror and a cup, an eye and a mouth. Thank you very much. Thank you, Galili, for the good old wine. Um, the, the next speaker is Menachem Lorberbaum, uh, who is the Vice Dean of Humanities and Professor of Jewish Philosophy at this university. He chaired the Graduate School of Philosophy and the Department of Jewish Philosophy at Tel Aviv University and was the founding chair of the Department of Hebrew Culture Studies starting in um, 2004. I didn't bring my uh, reading glasses. Uh, Professor um, Loberbaum is also a founded member of the Shalom Hartman Institute in Jerusalem, where he headed the Bet Midrash program. He is author of Politics and the Limits of Law, Stanford, 2001, and uh, We Are Dazzled by His Beauty, Mahon uh, Ben Tzvi, uh, to 2011. And more recently, his book, uh, Before Hasidism, Mossad Bialik. His work, work is of first order Jewish theology. I Seek Thy Countenance was published in 2018. Professor Loberbaum has also published three volumes of Hebrew verse and together with Dr. Michal Govrin, 
edited the Devarim poetry series of Carmel Publishers that published his book of translations of English poetry transpositions. Menachem, bevakasha. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Tova. Cool. Oh. This one is here, and this one is here. Great. Um, okay, good evening, everybody. It's uh, really a pleasure to be here. Um, and uh, I want to speak this evening about um, a certain chapter in what I take to be the reception history of uh, of Gabirol as Livriut as a poem and uh, as a poet and um, and what what seems to be an axial role of um, of Gabirol. Now the background for this is. Um, uh, first of all, is, is a certain understanding of Sefer Yetzirah, Kitab um, al-Mabadi. I'm not quite sure how to, how to even call it in, in, in English, but uh, um, let's say the, the, um, the Book of Beginnings, perhaps, or the, the Book of the Arche, if you think about the, the, the Greek term. Um, and... Um, this book, which we know very little about, is um, seems to appear in in a powerful way first in the uh, I think it's nine thirty one that uh, or nine thirty six that that uh, Rav Sadia Gaon writes a um, uh, a commentary to Sefer Yitzchak and also um, and also translates it into Arabic. Why? Sadia did this, why it was important for him, um, where does this book come from? These are all enigmas and wonderful enigmas because, um, because Sefer Yitzhira is probably the greatest uh, poetic success in the Hebrew language and is completely incomprehensible. Um, so, so this, and this is, this is actually quite wonderful. Um, um, how a poet can create a language and, and then it's, it's part of our background and we, and we just move along with it. This is incredible. Um, and, um, what's clear is that, that, that from Saadia on suddenly it catches like wildfire, wildfire, um, throughout any important um, um, Jewish intellectual um, center in in Europe and in the Middle East, it's everywhere. It's actually the first, it's the only non-biblical and rabbinic work that actually has commentaries to it, which is in itself something completely new. And what did they find in this book? How did they read it? But it's everywhere. It's, it's absolutely everywhere in the, um, in the uh, 10th, 11th, uh, 12th, and 13th centuries. Um, and at least I want to say what, one thing about, about Sefer Yitzra, because uh, um, I'm going to get to it in, in a moment in more detail, is that in my opinion, Sefer Yitzra has a, um, uh, uh, as, as the work somehow evolves in these centuries, it's probably pieced together from all kinds of, from, from a few different strands, but basically what it all shares is a certain fascination with, um, with schematization and a sort of, I call it a cybernetic fascination. Um, um, the authors or the author of Sefer Yitzirah is, is fascinated by, by what in math and logic and calculus we call functions. That is these kind of machines where you put in words or numbers or whatever it is and something comes out at the other end. And this is what he's doing all along, um, but it's, it's unclear what the functions serve. So, um, so it's a sort of, it, it, it's a cybernetic fascination. And this fascination will become crucial 
for um, for uh, that that form of Jewish uh, um, theosophy that that will be called Kabbalah, and and I want to look at one very important um, station, and this and this is Nachmanides' use of this. Now, why am I turning to Nachmanides? I'll tell you in a moment. Um, the uh, you, you see this. Um, Wonderful um, um, passage from Keto Marchut. Niflaim ha'asecha v'nafshi yodat v'od lecha Adonai ha'gedula v'agevura v'atif'evet v'anetzach v'ahod. Lecha Adonai ha'man lecha v'anetnasel lechol l'rosh v'ahosh v'akabot. Lecha b'ru e'mala u'mata ya'idu k'hema yobedu v'ata ta'amod. Lecha ha'givura sh'er v'sobda n'inu r'ayonenu l'amod ki a'atsam t'amimenu m'od. Lecha ha'chepion ha'oz ha'sod v'ayisod. This is also a very sublime uh, poetry, but what exactly this last line means, is completely enigmatic. Um, and we heard that he earlier today, he wrote his ma a wonderful master's thesis on this, on trying to decipher what is Hasod Vehayisod. Now, this is, this is a, a Gabirolian idiom. And um, what started me on the path that I'm going to is that I suddenly noticed it twice in Nachmanides' writings, uh, both in his commentary on the Torah, on the Pirush al Torah, and, and his commentary on Eov. So this, this right away uh, um, signaled something for me because this is a unique idiom, nobody uses it, but it's clear that, that Nachmanides is well aware of what Gabirol is doing and wants to take his certain Gabriel, Gabirolian poetic structures for, um, for his own work. And I'll say a bit more in a moment. So now I want to move. Okay, this is a bit challenging already for me. Did I do it correctly? No. Oh, now I want to read a Havticha too, because this is also in the background here. This is. This is amazing. I mean, you know, this, this is a poem that's written once in a millennium or two and, um, and rightfully has, has completely taken us, uh, all my teachers and myself, and I try to uh, let my students also feel the, 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 the wonderful erotics of knowledge and love of this poem. <laughs> וססתי על לבביך אשר תר להבין סוד פעולה צור ילדו. והדבר מאוד עמוק ורחוק, ומי ידע ומי יבין סודו. אבל להגיד לך דבר שמעתיב, ועליך להתבונן בסודו. חכמים אמרו, כי סוד היות קול למען קול אשר הקול בידו. What an amazing line, right? סוד היות קול למען קול אשר הקול בידו. Go figure that one. Who nichsaf le sumo yesh kemo yesh, or as Adi Tzemach uh, in his wonderful reading uh, suggested, maybe yesh bemo yesh, kemo choshek asher nichsaf le dodo. Ulai ze yedamu ha nevi'im, beomram ki berao al kevodo. Hashivot el chad bar ve'ata, kene mofet leman ha'amido. And uh, or Peter Cole's wonderful translation, of at least the certain line here. So they would call the man call asher a call be a dog. Okay, so, so I'm not going to. I'm going to now look at how hasod be yesod turns into so they would call the man call asher a call be a dog in um, Nachmanides' hands. Now, part of the background, is, as I will suggest, and here I'm, I'm continuing the line of thought that that I suggested years ago with regard to. Uh, um, um, to Gabirol's uh, uh, poem. Uh, um, now, see, if I can't even remember what I myself write, as Manas said, Edmut Sahal, right? In Edmut Sahal, there's that wonderful line where he's looking up at the sign, at, 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 at the skies, and he says, V'yesh um, kochav, and there is a, um, there is a star, asher chasa v'tzilo, u'marehu k'marei yud degusha. Completely difficult to decipher. I decided it's, it's basically he's looking at, he's sort of imagining uh, um, um, a, uh, um, the, the Arabic uh, nun. And 
and uh, but, but it doesn't matter. He's looking at Venus, as, uh, as, as I understand it, and suddenly, he suddenly shudders because he realizes that this is the Yud of the Tetragrammaton. And he pulls together in his poetic imagination the skies as, uh, uh, um, as, as the divine writ um, of letters. And, and of the divine name coming alive. And this is the poetics of contemplation that he's pulling us in through his, through his poem. And whether this, you accept this reading of Gabirol or not, it seems to me that something like this Nachmanides had in mind. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll show you how, because um, the, quest, the question is, the question is uh, um, how, how people like Gabirol, like Nachmanides, understand contemplation, meditation. What is the role that a metaphysical cosmology serves for them? And what is the relation between the atomic units of language and linguistic signification and atomic units of the cosmos. They're, this seems to me a problematic that they're very deeply engaged in. Um, and, and I want to follow a certain train of thought. And in order to begin that, let's just for a quick moment, I'll remind you of a, of a wonderful statement in Sefer Yetzirah, uh, and I'll, I'll read it in, in, uh, in Peter Hyman's translation. Uh, the ten sefirot are the basis, very bad word, but uh, Benima is not basis. Uh, Benima is, um, um, I would say, nothingness. The ten sifirot are of the nothingness. Ten and not nine, ten and not eleven. Understand with wisdom and be wise with understanding. Now, this is, this is a play on the book of Daniel, right? In the book of Daniel, in chapter nine, uh, Gabriel says to him, there's so many mice here on this table that I, I keep on moving the wrong words. It's okay, I'm cool. Uh, yeah. Um, um, uh, he says to me, and, and he informed me, that is, Gabriel is saying to Daniel, and talk with me. And he said, oh, Daniel, I come now forth to give thee skill and understanding. And he says to him, uh, um, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. Haven babina vechakem b'chokma is a play on this. I understand. And what is what? And, and what is what is? How does Sefer Yitzira, at least in one of its renditions, suggest? Uh, um, test them and investigate them and get the thing clearly and worked out and restore the Creator to the place. Um, and and so too in the, in in the next uh, um, uh, part in the next Mishnah. There now listen to how. How uh, uh, um, um, in the next Misha uh, about about the Sifirot themselves, with Sifiyatan or Sifionan Kemare Bazak, says Rav Saadia in, in his translation of this to Arabic, he says, Yelamah Ullaha Kilmahal Barak. Okay, this he understands that 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 the, the Sifirot are shining, right? They're, they're, they're um, um, they, they, um, uh, uh, they're flashes. They're flashes that come, and 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 you have to kind of, you've got to grasp them, you've got to catch them, and but they're moving. They're constantly in in movement. How do you do this? How do we catch them? How do we look at the at the divine when it's creating? A significated cosmos. Now, when you look at Rabbi Azriel uh, of Gironas, uh, who's slightly older than than uh, than Nachmanides, how he renders what this means in his own commentary to Sefer Yitzira, he understands that Tzifiyatan had Tzifiyash Adam Tzofebahem. Okay, the way you contemplate them or meditate upon them, 
right? So this is teaching the person who's meditating on the divine how it is that you grasp the divine shining. Hatsfiya. He hakoach anishach milemala lemata or slicha dibru ben beratzo dvaro ben beratzo vashov amutva. That is the natural, uh, the natural beings. Mit ale betzifiato. He, uh, he, he, he elevates himself through what? Through contemplation. Listakel bamurgash. To intellect. To intellect through the sensual. Vamurgash bamuskal. And the sensual in the intellect. Or in the intelligible. Vamuskal baneilam. And the intelligible in the mysterious, that which dissolves, that which is no longer. And then he goes to connect this with the Sephardic line. Now, bearing all this in mind, I think we can understand, we have a little bit of the background for where Nachmanides is coming from. And now we shall try to go down here a bit more. If I can do this, Zegadola uh, like, okay. I can do everything but move a slide forward in a... Okay, okay. This is another step on the way. Look at Sefer Rabahil. Okay? Uh, we don't know exactly when this is written, but the Nachmanides is already assuming this. And he's treating this as a canonized text. Now, that doesn't mean it's canonized. That could be that he's engaged in canonizing it. It's not the same thing. Don't, uh, don't fall into the trap of... of of positivists and fundamentalists. This is the infinite speaking, right? Okay, this is, we don't know enough, but I'll tell you how Nachmanides reads this. Nachmanides understand that the tree is the, is the divine sephirotic tree. This is the divine emanation. Uh, Hakol is uh, the divine phallus, which is the source of intellection and of creative power. All needs it, and everyone, everyone, uh, um, admires it, right? Everyone is admiring and contemplation. Which is clearly also playing with Sefer, with, uh, um, with Sefer Yetzirah. This is where the souls come from, right? Because in classic physiology, um, there's a tight connection between, between our ability to think and to intellect and semen. They're both connected and both come from the brain. Won't get into that. That also, when I made my world, and Alzi could mean the Shekhinah, could mean the lowest of the Sephirot, right? This is the, uh, the Heros Damos, What is this sort? The sod is to understand the sod. The sod is to understand the vibe of erotics and sexuality. That's what Sefer, um, that's what Sefer Rabahir is about. Now, look at what Nachmanides does with it. Now, Nachmanides is wonderful because, you know, he's a real halachist. He's probably one of the greatest analytic minds of, of the halachic tradition, a real jurist, and his spiritual life is this. So it, it makes for a very fascinating combination. Uh, um, and okay, now I should try. Ah, I did it. But first, okay, let me let me take a quick one. Uh, uh, now look at look at this for example. Okay, this is the Ramban on Bereshit Chavdan Medalef. Vadonai berachet Avraham bakol, and the Lord. Uh, blessed Abraham with everything, okay? Uh, so Nachmanides is now going to make the most, it's going to capitalize on what? On, on the rabbinic saying 
that that uh, um, that Abraham was also blessed with a daughter named Bakol. Okay, now he goes wild. And Right, because she's made it with the coal. That's bakol means by means of coal. Right, this is uh, God's, uh, 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 the lowest sifira, the shechina, is also uh, uh, um, the last, uh, uh, the last uh, uh, station of, of the divine emanation. We have Keter and we have Malchut in Gabibol's language. This is the Malchut. That's the call A, call plus A. Bavur she he klula min ha call. He she chachamim echanim shma keneset Israel bi kavod rabim. Bavur she he klusa ta call. Okay, now look look at the way he works. Now this is in the middle of the pirush on the Torah, right? Usually now Ramban Nachmanides is a very acute reader of the Torah very careful reader. I think he is the first medieval commentator that really appreciates plot and character. And he makes the most of it. But he suddenly has these passages where he wants to give us the deeper meaning of the, of the text. Now you see that sod, sod doesn't mean secret in the sense of a guarded knowledge. That is as a uh, um, uh, what we share. So it means the depth dimension, um, and um, and Nachmanides throughout his pirush at different points wants to surface the depth dimension because he thinks that that's the key to understanding how we understand the workings of divine providence through the unification of time place through the dynamics of, um, of uh, narrative. So it's, it's a very complex structure that he builds, but here you can see clearly what he did. He, this is a combination of everything. He's teaching us how you look at the way divine power works in the world. That's the question. Is my time over? Tell me when you want. <laughs> I'm always ready to step down. That's fine. Five minutes to pull it together, sir. As much as you, a minute, that's good too. But this is a, this is a good this is a good example because what you see here is you see how Nachmanides is working. He has many traditions, and he's pulling them he's pulling them together. Let me give you one last one, and we'll finish with that. So I just know that I, um, look at how he says. Uh, this is in, in Bereshit Aleph. Bereshit, he follows the Targum that Reshit is Bechochmeta, right? With wisdom or with Sophia, which is the, uh, which is one of the higher Sephirot. Bekaveratam zu shemila Bereshit irmoz ki be'esel Sephirot nivra ha'olam as we're taught in Sefer Yitzira. Beremez le Sephira ha'nikret chochma sheba yisot kol na. He's writing a prose in a single line, but he's really creating a structure. Right? The Yisod is the expression of the Chokhmah in the world. He Teruma, that's the Chokhmah, the He Kodesh. Ein la Shiur, there's no measure to the divine wisdom. Then we know that's the Malchut. He moves between them. He's constantly looking for the poetics of how it is that we allow this to speak. Now, I have different other examples, but this. Maybe I'll give you a little taste um, uh, about this, and um, I hope I wasn't too terse. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Menachem, for an excited and ex exciting speech. And uh, for a minute, I forgot that I am the chair of this session. <laughs> Uh, our last speaker uh, is Uriah Kfir from Ben Gurion University. He will talk about Solomon Ibn Gabriel as a literary hero, a thousand, year, thousand years of representation. Uriah is a senior lecturer in medieval Hebrew poetry in the Department of Hebrew uh, Literature at BGU. Um, his uh, joint project with Dr. Dudu Rotman entitled The Hebrew Poem F Poet, F uh, Poet from Spain as a Literary Hero was awarded an Israel Science Foundation grant in uh, 2018. His book, A Matter of Geography, A New Perspective on Medieval Hebrew Poetry, was published by Brill in And I'm also a student of, of, of uh, Professor Tovaloze. Uh, I would like to, talk, to start my talk with a short fragment from the TV show Shababnikin, where Mayor, a young yeshiva bucher, goes to see the matchmaker. Okay. Right, there is so much to say about this wonderful dialogue, but for present purposes, most interesting is what it has to say about Ibn Gabirol, or more precisely, what it doesn't say about him. Not when he lived, not where he lived, not even that he was a poet. The only thing said about Ibn Gabirol is that he was a classa, and that arranging a marriage with his great-grandson would be the dream of any Jewish mother. Put differently, the name of the poet is known and famous and even perpetuated in street signs throughout Israel, but the poet's actual biography and characters remain vague and devoid of a clear context. Shaul Chernichovsky couldn't hide his frustration with this type of lack of information. Whenever I finish reading one of our poets from medieval Spain, I feel sad. I close my eyes trying to picture where the poet came from. When did he live? What can be said about his surroundings? Who were the gazelles and the beloveds that he wrote about? And I see nothing. Phrase after phrase, formula after formula, hyperbole after hyperbole, beautiful terms, astute expressions, and yet no picture, no vision, no sight. The ordinary reader who sees only what his eyes show him and who is not familiar with scholarly nuances, thin as hair's breadth, is doomed to be completely detached. This frustration, which I believe we all feel to one extent or another in our work, was the driver for my joint project with uh, Dudu Rotman from the Hebrew University, entitled The Hebrew Poet from Spain as a Literary Hero. Unlike studies devoted to the, to the literary works of this poet, we are interested in the in literary works written about them. Our project analyzes a long and rich tradition which extends from the Middle Ages to our times consisting of poems, short stories, novels, folk traditions, plays, popular songs, even in opera and comic books, all of which are meant to ease Chernichovsky frustration by imagining the personas of medieval Hebrew poets from Spain and depicting, we're not practically inventing, their characters and life stories. Most of the works in our study are in Hebrew, though from time to time, uh, we do come across uh, works in other languages, and Heine's poem about uh, on uh, Judah Levy is a famous example. 
One of the key concepts in our work is Michel Foucault's The Name of the Author, which is not at all identical to the biographical author himself. Sometimes they are not related whatsoever. Rather, the author's name is a cultural construct resembled from an array of images that have become associated with the poet's figure throughout history and in the literature, which together with its opera, determine his status in collective memory. The hero of my paper today is of course, Shlomo Ibn Gabirol, or more specifically, not the historical figure, but his literary representations over the course of 1000 years. I do not presume to cover all the representations of Ibn Gabirol in the literature, Rather, this is an attempt to present a quick preliminary survey, which highlights some of Ibn Gabriel's literary images, which I feel are the most important or interesting. The starting point of my inquiry is Ibn Gabriel Azharot for Shavuot, a very long piyut that counts the 613 mitzvot in the Torah. As is evident in printed books and in manuscripts, um, Ibn Kabirot Zazarot was extremely popular and has been incorporated into the liturgy of many communities. It has been studied in numerous exegesis. We found at least a dozen, and here are two examples, and translated into Arabic, Persian, and Judeo-Spanish. And here is the Persian example. I would guess that not many of you are teaching the Azarot in your classes, but until the modern era, it was one of the most famous piyutim by Ibn Gabi, of Ibn Gabirol and the poem that was probably the most closely identified with him. On the other hand, this is one of his most generic piyutim whose technical subject, counting the mitzvot, leaves practically no room for any personal expression. This tension between the popularity of the Azarot on the one hand and its extremely impersonal nature on the other has created a fruitful terrain for folk traditions and stories told by people who wanted to depict uh, the figure of the poet who wrote the poet, the piyut they were so fond of. In a sense, the Azarot are to Ibn Gabirol what Sion Alot Ishali is to Judah Levi, a poem or a piyut with such popularity that people felt the need to associate it with the biography of its author. Moshe Ibn Tibon, for example, wrote in the 13th century that Ibn Gabirol composed the first part of the piyut, Mitzvot Aseh, as a young man, and completed the second part, Mitzvot Lot Aseh, in his final days. In other words, the Azarot are not an ordinary piyut, but the poet's life work. Another tradition documented by Yosef Sambari in 17th century Egypt, indicates that Ibn Gabriel was 16 when he wrote the Azarot, to which the author associated two stories. The first is about a singing competition that Ibn Gabriel had with a Gentile. The judge the rival chose was a horse who kept drinking from its trough as long as the gentle sang, but lifted his head and pointed his ears in concentration the moment Ibn Gabirol opened his mouth. The second and more famous story is about Ibn Gabirol's murder by, by, a rival, by, by a rival poet. The jealous poet buried Ibn Gabirol's body in a field, but it was discovered when a wondrous watermelon full of blood grew on the grave. Other versions of the story have figs or pomegranates instead of the watermelon. Another story about Ibn Gabirol and his Azarot, cited by Abraham Meir Haberman from a Yemenite manuscript, recounts that Ibn Gabirol wrote the piyut when he was 18 and dropped it down his rabbi chimney in an attempt to win the hand of the rabbi's daughter. A modern example of this tradition appears in Agnon Hasiman, uh, we heard about it before, where the author summons and revives Ibn Gabirol by reciting the Azarot. However, perhaps the most interesting and surprising folk tradition about Ibn Gabirol and his, and his Azarot is found in the writings of travelers and, pilgr and pilgrims to the Holy Land, especially from early modern times, which repeatedly mention a burial cave located, located in the Muslim village of Kabul in Western Galilee. Strikingly, this cave is said to be the resting place of no fewer than three Andalusian Hebrew poets, Shlomo ibn Gabirol, Yehuda Levi, and Avraham ibn Ezra. Furthermore, an 18th century legend describes an olive oil lamp that the local Muslim light every night at the mouth of this cave in honor of ibn Gabirol, except of the, on the night of Tisha B'Av. 
on that night alone, a horrible cry is heard from the cave, which extends, the cave extends all the way to Jerusalem. I would not have mentioned this tradition here, except that once again, Ibn Gabriel is regularly, is regularly described as Baal Hazarot, as you can see. The identification of Ibn Gabriel with the Hazarot became so strong that they became his moniker. They became his author's name. Naturally, other folk stories have been told about Ibn Gabriel. One well-known story from the 17th century, which scholars suggested might be connected to Ibn Gabriel's interest in Sefer Yetzirah, which Menachem talked about, recounts that he created a type of golem slave girl. Um, this famous story was incorporated into Agnon's uh, Idov Einam and was adapted as a play by Yosefa Ibn Shushan and as a comic sketch by Eli Eshed and Karen Katz. An earlier story, which remains in manuscript form, is about a Muslim bathhouse that was built on his grave in Sevilla. The deceased Ibn Gabirol revealed himself to a civilian Jew in a dream and told him to warn the, the town's Jews not to bathe there. However, neither of these stories refer specifically to any piyut, not the Azarot or any other one. Unlike folk tradition, the critical literature on medieval Hebrew poetry does not seem to think much of the Azarot. Chaim Shirman, for example, dismissed the Azarot in a short comment where he lumped them And we will lump them with other putin on themes which, likewise, quote, are not fit for poetry. Instead, he, as well as, well as many others, focus on poems which present a dual romantic perception of Ibn Gabirol as an isolated, suffering poet who nevertheless had high spiritual aspiration. What is important here is that this dual image has also uh, permeated the literature. A typical example is Yudha Michai, who was a student of Shirman at the Hebrew University and who depicted and who dedicated poems to Shmuel Nagid, Yudha Levi, and Ibn Gabirol. The latter poems opened dramatically, sometimes past, sometimes a poem, something always burst out and always pain. But he also de uh, describe, describes the poet as a divine medium through whom alien chest God peers into the world. Similarly, Yaakov Kahan, talked about the poet's element of the flesh, but also about his soaring spirit. The American poet Itzhak Zilberschlag called Ibn Gabriel a marvelous vulture who sings to God with the cherubs, but remains nevertheless a poet who is rejected by society and whose writings uh, express despair and grief as though he were bearing all the sorrow of the world on his shoulders. Called Ke'ev v'yeush, k'ilu ofkad sar kol ha'olam betzal otecha. Another fascinating example is found in a poem by Uwe Zvi Greenberg, who called Ibn Gabirot the divine, but also referred to him as diasporic and weak, and thus lacking the spirit of sovereignty, regesh adnut, needed for a modern national revival. Other works of this sort are, for example, the poem Shlomo Ibn Gabirol, Shlomo Ibn Gabirol by Yaakov Fichman, uh, written in 1945, and Alayla Haron, by Moshe Ben Menachem, written in 1951, the short story Hanitzachon by Yochanan Tversky, written in 1978, the novel Hamshore by Sarah Glusman, published in the same year, and the novella with the intriguing name and uh, intriguing title, Achoto Shel Ibn Gabirol, by Rachel Heyman, which was published in 2014. This literary shift of Ibn Gabirol's image from Baal Azarot to a poet who is jettisoned from divine heights to earthly misery marks a shift, albeit partial, of Ibn Gabirol from the synagogue liturgy and folklore to a more secular, universal, and highbrow arena. Remarkably, this shift has also led to the rewriting of earlier traditions. The story about Ibn Gabriel's murder, for example, that was associated in the 17th century with the Azarot, was told 300 years later as a story of Ibn Gabriel's unrequited love for Naomi, a physician daughter who was betrothed to another. The beginning of the story adheres completely to the new perception of Ibn Gabriel. The poet had just written a poem, which one? And the story doesn't say. He was sick, emaciated, his lungs were racked from heavy coughing, 
He was so exhausted from his immense labor on poetry, philosophy, and morals in which he expressed his exalted ideas about the creator, the creation, and the ultimate purpose of humanity on this earth. It is only after this exposition and after a disappointing encounter with Naomi that Ibn Gabriel finds his death at the hands of a rival poet. <laughs> this legend in particular has many variants. In one of them, <coughs> Ibn Gabriel, you cannot see. Can I move it? Okay. So Ibn Gabriel is a, a Gilgul, a reincarnation of King David. Another version, published in Hela Mizrah, a magazine with a Sephardic orientation, sees it as a symbol of the unfortunate decline of Jewish and Muslim relations. A third fascinating example, published in the Maskilic HaKarmel, long before Ibn Gabirol was depicted as miserable and repulsive, described him as a handsome young man, respected by all and admired by the ladies. While the Azarot apparently lost some of the former glory in modern literature, we do find the reoccurrence of Keter Malchut. Here are two examples by Gilad Zubavel and Itzik Manger in a Hebrew translation, which still adhere closely to the romantic image of Ibn Gabirol. Note the fantastic rhyme, Cordova Jehovah, or the depiction of Ibn Gabirol as Nigas Benane, hunted and tortured. A third example by Yaakov Rimon is completely different. Um, the poet, the lesser known brother of Yosef Tzvirimon, dismissing any sign of suffering, took Ibn, Ibn Gabirol back to the synagogue. Ktorlik Tarecha, Rabbi Shlomo Ibn Gabirol, Yaatreni Piyutecha, Manaamta Li Ibn Gabirol, Kasmali Dmut Nivecha, Miyalduti Shibatslicha Bechubi, Davakti Bipiyutcha, Bepiyutcha Meromam, and so on. Finally, another example of revamped older tradition which serves new goals and needs is found in the tradition about Ibn Gabirol's burial cave in Kabul. A recent evolution of this tradition appears in the rabbinical responsum published in uh, 2010. The Hasid asks his rabbi. It is stated in the holy books that on the eve of Tisha B'Av, one can hear the sound of weeping coming from the tomb of Ibn Ezra and Rabbi Shlomo Ibn Gabirol in the village of Kabul. But who is crying? The righteous man who is buried there or the divine presence? And the, rabbi, and the rabbi replies, all of the departed righteous weep at midnight, and especially on Tisha B'Av, and those of merit hear it. The Hasid question is part of a growing trend in recent years that makes Ibn Gabirol's grave, which is grave, which is located in a Palestinian village, an attraction for young ultra-Orthodox men who see the nocturnal expedition as a daring adventure fraught with imaginary danger and political significance. An earlier testimony of this sort appeared in an article published in Haboker newspaper in 1954, which reports the pilgrimage of people from the Mushavim in the area to the grave and describes a new version of the legend where every Tisha Be'av, the cave is filled to the brim by the tears shed by the worshippers. However, rather than having merely political or religious significance, in this, in this case, Ibn Gabirol seems to primarily represent a Mizrahi and a Sephardic source of identification and admiration, which brings us back, in conclusion, to the matchmaker from the Shababnikim, for whom as well Ibn Gabirol, like Rav Ovadia, is admired first and foremost as, as a Sephardic role model and a Mizrahi symbol of pride. So, bottom line, who was Ibn Gabirol, and the great, grand, uh, uh, the great, uh, grandson, uh, the great grandfather of the desired uh, groom. It depends on who you ask. He can be a gifted writer, philosopher, Bala Azarot, suitor, rejected suitor, mystic, magician, handsome man, righteous man, quick tempered, respected, isolated, humble, arrogant, vocalist, moralist, a Mizrahi role model, a spiritual poet, or a tortured one a bridge between Jews and Muslims or a victim of the rivalry. The response that comes closer to the truth is probably that Ibn Gabirol's name of the author is an assemblage of all his representation over the course of 1,000 years. Tada.
תודה רבה, אוריה. אני חושבת שאי אפשר היה לבחור הרצאה יותר מתאימה לסיום הכנס הזה. הערות, שאלות, תהיות. אם לא, אז אה, נסכם באמירת תודה רבה למארגנים של הכנס הזה, ואני אומרת את זה בשם כולם, ועומר אה, יבוא לומר כמה דברי סיכום. Thank you so much, Tova, and thank you for this uh, wonderful final three talks. Um, I will not say much more um, uh, than Tova did, um, mostly because it is practically impossible uh, to summarize or uh, uh, what we've been going through for the past uh, three days. Um, or to conclude the, the paths for possible future research that has opened up in our attempt to share a conversation across uh, different disciplines, uh, which we basically were very fearful that would be an astounding failure, but has proved to be a, a, a rather fruitful and productive and uh, uh, um, uh, suggesting so many new possibilities um, in so many different ways. I mean, in terms of, of question on the workings of language in both poetry, but also in philosophical discourses, in terms of conventions and traditions and also the possibility of looking at the realm of philosophy as uh, full of its own traditions and uh, on contexts, um, religious contexts, intellectual contexts, um, um, historical contexts, um, the varying ones uh, uh, um, and, and uh, um, those that that we are aware of and those that we, if not deny, then at the very least neglect. And uh, I think that, that new frontiers has been opened, at least for me, but I, I'm sure that, that for many of us. And uh, um, so concluding, I cannot, but, but I, I can think. Um, I, I think uh, wholeheartedly my... my um, who came to be a dear friend and, and also, of course, esteemed colleague, uh, Ariel Zinder, Tovim Mashnaim Mina Echad, Mamash Kacha, and uh, um, to Hila Brockman, our wonderful producer who has uh, made things work. I'm sure that it would have been impossible otherwise. Um, um, to Dotan and David, who has been uh, uh, doing constant uh, uh, work in, in the past uh, uh, three days. Um, uh, I, I thank you both as well. Uh, and and uh, most of all, to all of our participants and guests, both uh, the ones who are here and, and the ones who very much wanted to be uh, with us here, but uh, for uh, so understandable reason, could not. And uh, um, your presence was much felt. And uh, um, uh, there was much intellectual effort put, I think, in the past three days. And we so much appreciate your willingness to make this effort together. Um, and uh, um, both to... to, to um, suffer the frustration of, of trying to grapple with uh, unknown discourses and, and modes of, of scholarship and the pleasures of, of suddenly having uh, this, this, this uh, moments of when, when something 
new comes up. Uh, um, and I, I think there is no better way that, that we as scholars know of to, to celebrate the legacy, the times and the figure of Solomon Ibn Gabirol than this one. אז תודה רבה לכולם, ולהתראות, תם ולא נשלם.